I blossomed later in life when it came to uh, drinking alcohol. You know, for a very long time in my, you know, even childhood upbringing, high school, I was like, I'm never going to drink you know, alcoholism, addiction ran into my family, mental health issues. And I was like, no, I'm I'm not going to drink. I'll stay away. You know, and of course, in high school, I smoked pot, nothing that was problematic. I just think that that is what I did in high school. But it wasn't until I was 19. That's when I started drinking because living in the suburbs of Detroit, you could go over to Windsor because their drinking age in Canada is 19. And that was like a 20 minute 20 minute drive to be able to go across the border and go to the bars. So it was 19 that I started drinking alcohol and I just instantly fell in love with it. And in that love affair, it progressively turned into, of course, my addiction and just something that just progressed and progressed year after year. By the time I was 25, I knew I was going to have to give up drinking alcohol. And then I did at 29. And when you first, I'm curious, did it give you the, a lot of people that I've talked to, they had like this alcohol energy, alcohol, Mm -hmm. alcohol induced like tons of energy and euphoria where some people, they'd have a few drinks and be like, that's it. That's fine. I'm good. And Mm -hmm. they could stop. Whereas a lot of people, they'll just, the more they drink, the more energy and euphoria and courage they get. And then just make all these bad decisions. Yeah, well, yeah, I mean, I definitely caught that high very <laughs> every I mean, almost, almost every time when I would drink, it would be like, yes, that that high, that euphoria, and then it would just come like crashing down. You know, I was a person who blacked out a lot of the times. Of course, too, I do want to say uh, my drinking didn't start off off the bat. I don't think anyone starts drinking being like, I'm going to be an alcoholic, right? I'm going to have issues with this. It it progressed and it got darker. So within my drinking in that euphoria of, of it, then there would be the come down or into my blackout and then all the rage and hate and, you know, spitting venom at people would, would come out in my drinking. I don't really believe, I have to say this, I don't really believe when people are like, oh, the truth comes out when you're drunk. I think that it's years of suppressed emotions come out when you're drunk, and then it's just projected onto the loved ones that, you know, you care about the most. They get the end of your trauma. They get the brunt of it, right? Yeah, it's awful. And then uh, there's nothing like the next day after a night of blacking out because mm-hmm. pretty much every time the shame hits you right off the bat because you know you didn't you know that your behavior it's not like when you black out you do nice things for people right. oh i'm gonna buy this person a write them a card and, and hand write this card and make them a little arts and crafts gift i haven't talked to them mm-hmm. in so long or oh i'm gonna call my grandma i haven't ha- talked to her in a while i love you so much that's when people are like tipsy but when you're blacked out it's usually oh what did i do Mm-hmm. The, the most earth-shattering, shame-inducing uh, behaviors. Are you familiar with um, an exercise called the shame shiver by chance? I am not. It's, Do tell. Heard, okay, so I heard this on a Charlie Sheen interview a few years ago. I guess okay. he was looking pretty bad, but he had he stated that he had about three years, uh, no mm-hmm. alcohol, no drugs. Mm-hmm. And he said the way he's able to do it Um, is every time he gets an urge to use or desire or even thinks about it at all, he said he has about three three memories that he has, pretty recent memories toward the end of his addiction, that he said that he thinks about one, then the second one and the third one, and he does them in sequence, and he feels they caused him so much shame, these three things. Mm -hmm. So what he'll do is he'll visualize them kind of relive them and then he'll he'll literally shiver when he feels the shame he calls it the shame shivers so he'll make himself remember just how much shame that that can cause him and then he realizes okay i don't want to do that go down that path again i thought that was a cool technique i had never heard it from anyone else i guess it's like some pro social uh shame and i thought that was cool that is cool. I have to say, I do in my in my sobriety, especially too for those first 
I want to say first five years. On Sundays, I would always do something similar to that, where I would sit there for about five minutes and remember a time that in my active addiction where it was not good. Because there was, I have to say, there was 10% of the time that I did have fun, Mm -hmm. and I'm never going to take that away, right? But like 90% of the time, my drinking always led me to, to the pits. So I, on those Sunday practices, almost like a meditative state of just sitting there, closing your eyes and remembering a time that I was hungover, that I laid on the couch and dry heaved on the floor. One of my moments of, you know, losing my rescue cat for the second time or, you know, a failed opportunity or whatever it might be. But it, those remembering that kind of stuff will continue to help you live uh, long-term sobriety. Because when you remember that, you're like, I don't ever want to go back there, man. <laughs> like, no, thank you. Because I want to, nobody would have the life that they have currently if they were still using drugs and alcohol for the people who have uh, an issue with it. Mm-hmm. And what, what was your age? Uh, you quit, I think you said when you were 29 or I could 29. Be- yeah. I was just six weeks shy of being 30. Yeah. So you, and I was 32 and then the my co-host of this podcast that's been uh hasn't been on an episode in quite some time because he is stretched so thin doing so many different business uh type things mm-hmm. with the alcohol recovery niche uh but anyways i think he was around 28 29 somewhere around there too and so then you probably know uh that tr- quitting at that age is really hard because all the other people of our that same age group that's what a lot of people do so i'm curious with you um was it a social thing or did you even find yourself some parts of your alcohol addiction where you were waking up in the morning to round the clock you know total alcohol dependence or was it more of kind of just like on and off binge drinking and then what eventually led you to like what were i'm guess i'm curious what are some things maybe that you tried that didn't work um like you know making rules only alcohol yeah. only beer yeah. only wine i'm curious what kind of the end looked like how sure. how the transition was some of the things that you tried and then what eventually you know stuck with you and then the path forward from there to where not only did you recover um from just a alcohol is so addictive it's ridiculous and mm-hmm. certain places it's harder to quit certainly in places mm-hmm. like detroit and michigan i can only imagine you're going across the canadian border when you're Mm -hmm. young um drinking there so it's just like how did you uh, get to where you are now which is i can tell you're healthy intelligent creative intuitive fulfilled and you're helping other people uh with your coaching you know podcasting website and all that yeah so i i have to say my drinking that for the for the 10 years it was all over the place so it used to be every day right like i there would be some days on the weekends it's like all right i don't have to work today like let's get up and and party and and have have some hair of the dog right and do some day drinking and then there would be times where it would just be binge drinking where i could go a week without drinking and then party on the weekends or you know party on a wednesday and and not drink them for five days so my 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 uh pattern with drinking was all over the place but from 25 to 29 i really tried to moderate my drinking and i tried to control it and like you said i tried to be like okay i'm only gonna have beer today okay i'm not gonna do any shots with jameson okay i'm just not going to drink dirty martinis anymore you know like it was just all all of it i'm not gonna do cherry bombs anymore it like all of it and i'm so happy i missed the uh the fireball craze because that would have taken me out for sure so all of those little rules I tried to put on myself and like, oh my God, you better eat because we know when you don't eat, what happens? So, and it just became exhausting, became exhausting. But like I said, at 25, I knew I was gonna have to quit drinking one day. I think we all, all of us who have a problem with alcohol, we the thought always comes to us, right? But it's whether or not we do something about it. And I, I really do believe that we all have this thought so at 25 i had the thought like you're gonna have to live without alcohol one day 
don't know how you're going to get there, but it's going to be part of your path. So from 25 to 29, try to do it all, you know, try to moderate it. And that became exhausting. So by the time I was 29, it was six weeks shy of being uh, 30. I lost my rescue cat for a second time. And like, you know, when you love something more than yourself, yeah. especially an animal, mm-hmm. you feel like a, a, a you you feel like a terrible person, especially too when you were in a blackout and you lost him for a second time. And it was I was living with my my uh, then boyfriend and it was after my night of of my last shift in the rest in the bar industry. And then I was going into the medical field for for good. <laughs> Of course, it was another same morning that I had had for years upon years. And this was just when the universe opened up to me and was like, okay, we're going to, I'm going to show you one more time of where your drinking ends. And I finally found my cat after three days. Um, and and I said, like, I'm going to give up drinking for good because I knew it. And to be honest, and I don't know if you were at that point too, like I was exhausted. I was more exhausted on being on that cycle where I felt like it was an 85 year old and just like, you know, you get sick and tired and I was, I was good and and done. So for me, there was no more trying to moderate it and make this work. It was like, you, you got to give this up for good because it's the one thing that's holding you back. So I, I gave it up for good. And I don't even have like, of course, in the past 11 years, I have had thoughts of like, could I drink a couple? Could I be normal now, you know? And then it's like those practices we talked about. And I was like, well, no, because what I have in my life now, it's because I gave up alcohol. I made one choice and one decision to turn it around and let go of something that was holding me back. You know, so I always like to say that to people. It's like, you got to remember giving up alcohol or drugs made your life better. So even to try to dabble in that again, it's not worth it because you don't even want to see where it's going to take you, right? So so that that's how I, at the end, how it got for me. So it was just, it was time for me to stop drinking completely. So the, uh, the positive benefits, the subjective associations that you had towards alcohol of pleasure, fun, freedom positive benefits you know euphoria all that those went way down over time and the negative consequences went <clears throat> went way 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 up so when you first started drinking it was like this is great you have yeah. way more benefits from it mm-hmm. so it was a net resource for your life because it you know yeah it's not healthy for you to drink that much but when you're young and you got a healthy liver you can do that stuff and it's yeah it can be tons of fun like wow mm-hmm. When you're out with friends and you're partying like that, like some of the experience you can have are just so exhilarating and Mm -hmm. making great memories and connecting with other people. Uh, But then, like you were saying, once you get to the end, when you're that tired, when it's just you've tried to moderate for so many times and then you get all health. One of the most discouraging things uh, for me was I'd get myself all healthy again. I'd be surfing and going to the gym and eating pretty good and you know building fitness and health back and getting my mind health mm-hmm. back and some confidence back and then just out of the blue i'd find myself drinking again when i didn't want to but i just find myself an autopilot going to buy alcohol whether it was um uh, friends offering it to me or just automatically having something stressful happen all of a sudden and going to the store to get alcohol and then i would all that progress I made in health and fitness, etc. Mm-hmm. The binge drinking would just destroy it so fast, and I'm like, shit. Now I have, you know, it, it was really, really exhausting. I really resonated mm-hmm. with when you're talking about that. And then, yeah, you know, like, okay, I'm gonna have to quit this. And then it's just about figuring out how you're gonna do it, when you're gonna do it, and then just sucking it up and and doing it. And then I'm curious is also when you did quit what did that first did you have like bad withdrawals from it or did you have any anxiety or loss of sleep how fast did you kind of how long do you think it would take before you felt kind of normal again that's what a lot of people are afraid of like have i done permanent damage with all this alcohol will i ever be able to relax and enjoy life without alcohol 
Is am I ever, am, am I going to be bored all the time and dull? So yeah. what does that look like for you? Well, de- definitely, it took me because I was on the nightlife schedule, even too, of working in a bar for so many years. So one, I have to say for my sleep, it took me a while to get my sleep from the like 4 a.m. to 2 p.m. <laughs> to, uh, you know, then the 10 p.m. to like 5, 30, 6, 6 a.m. So it took me a minute to get my rhythm to normal. But I have to say, when I got sober, I for 90 days, I kind of I, I I sat down and I laid low and I think that was the best thing that I did because a lot of my drinking was very social it was out and about I wasn't a person who sat at home and drank like yeah I would have a cocktail you know before getting like getting ready or going out but it wasn't uh coming home and grabbing wine and that was not not my thing I liked being out So for me, I had to do the complete opposite when I got sober. So I sat on my ass and I um, binge watched because this was back in 2012. So like binge watching just started happening. And I had to binge watch Friday Night Lights because it was like a wholesome show. And I had to mod podge picture frames. I had to do arts and crafts to keep my mind and, and hands busy you know, during that Friday night when I would get the itch. So I think that that, I think a lot of people uh, want to skip that process. And here's, you're never going to skip that. You got to get through those first couple months and really try to build yourself a solid foundation of incorporating some new type of habits to replace your old one, right? Like, and I didn't have hobbies. I had a Google hobbies a week or two into my sobriety. I'm like, you know, <laughs> what, it, what, what, all I knew was working and drinking. Um, so that's where I came up with some arts and crafts. So, and then going back to stuff that I enjoyed when I was a kid, which was baking. So I really kind of just sat down and got quiet and, um, and just, let the process take its course for me because everybody's different right like so yes to answer your question anxiety would come up especially on friday nights because that was my night of drinking and it would be like oh god what am i going to do with all this time and then you start noticing how much free time you have Mm -hmm. and and that's where you have to find things to fit your time um instead of drinking so i have to say the anxiety the exhaustion you know what you're in is pause which is post-acute withdrawal syndrome, which I'm sure you know. And you have to ride that out for your body. And it can take people a minute. You know, I definitely think I was in that process for a good six months. Wow, yeah, that's substantial. And I mean, you were drinking a ton and you're, you know, you're uh, females in general too. Like if you're drinking like more than a lot of the guys and with the female body type to alcohol, Mm -hmm in most cases is even more detrimental so Mm -hmm. i guess that's definitely not unheard of but yeah that's a long time to be dealing with those kind of intermittent just pesty lingering symptoms despite like you said you instead of going out with people you did the and i call the post-acute withdrawal phase so there's the detox i like Mm -hmm. all the r words so it's (laughs) rest Mm -hmm. repair rejuvenate rebalance recreation rehabilitation rejuvenation restoration all these r words during the post-acute withdrawal and yeah a lot of people uh of course on the grand scheme of things you know what's four to six weeks of just resting and just but then when the when you're the person going through it mm-hmm. like logically four to six weeks in the grand scheme of things for you to get a lot better it's not that much but when it's the person if you're the person going through that sometimes the post-acute symptoms can be so bad especially like the anhedonia the inability to feel pleasure and stuff and the exhaustion then the people are like screw this am i that's when they start to their brain mm-hmm. plays tricks on them i've done mm-hmm. permanent brain damage uh i was getting better now the, these last few days i seem to be getting worse screw this i can't mm-hmm. take it all the fear uncertainty and so you this last time 11 years ago you had the resolve to get through that versus so many people myself included many times um up until the last time you know 
I didn't have the resolve to get through that. It was like, ah, I can't get through all this. It's so easy to go start drinking again. Mm -hmm. Well, and I have to say, because, you know, through the years, people are like, I I can't believe you stayed sober this long. Like, you know, would you ever go back or like uh, when you talk about relapse, I'm like, I don't have it in me to do another day one. And I still have to bring that thought up into my head from time to time, you know, just to be like, nope, because that day one to 90 days, I mean, those first three months, they're hard. They're very hard. Um, And just to go through that physical stuff. But that's not but that's where you have to give your body patience. And that's what um, people under don't understand. It's like they think they give up drinking and then it's like life is good. (laughs) <laughs> and then you start realizing like, okay, this is, I put poison in my body for years of years and years and years on a daily basis for, for so many, like, so you are going just because you quote unquote, didn't look like you had a problem <laughs> or you weren't living on the streets, th- that, that poison still has to go through a detox process. You still have to figure out why to eventually why you were drinking the way that you did and why you had such an emotional dependence on alcohol. So it's just, it's a process that, that everyone has to go through. It just looks different for everybody. Right. Yeah, it sure does. And uh, that's what a lot of people, when they'll go to the AA meetings or NA meetings or even other types of programs, they'll like say it's an inpatient or a sober living house or something. Some people do so well with that. And it's like the shoe fits perfect. It's like when they're trying on the glass slippers with Cinderella, it's like Mm -hmm. (laughs) different people. It never fit me quite that good. And yeah. so then the uh, so there's people that go there go well they're telling me if I don't stick with this they're gonna I'm gonna end up in jails institutions and death so I'm so stoked to hear uh, someone else saying yeah it looks different for each person whether it's the the symptoms why they the underlying reasons of why they drink what how they're gonna you know create their early recovery plan their long term relapse prevention plan yeah and that's and that just shows. Uh, you've developed, I can tell, a lot of wisdom too, that, and that's what it, time, time alone won't give people wisdom. It's also it's the time invested in the personal growth, and I can tell uh, that you've done quite a lot of that. I also wanted to ask too about your friends. You were hanging out by yourself, and you were in between, I think, jobs, or you were starting. Um, or leaving restaurants and starting, I think, nursing or medical or something. I might. Mm-hmm. Anyway. Yeah, w- yes. I was going into the, I, I was already working in the medical field, but just very part time. And so then I was transferring or um, transitioning into doing full time and then finally leaving my bar, my bar job. So, okay. So, and then when you finally successfully quit this last time, all those years ago, mm-hmm. did you kind of just ditch all your friends or did you still hang out with friends just you took a break with them for a while because for me all throughout my 20s um probably when i was 24 i was like i got an alcohol problem mm-hmm. uh, I, but i could figure it out on my own mm-hmm. and then i went when i was like 24 and a half to my first aa meeting well then for like the next eight nine years i wanted to quit but i couldn't for more than a few months usually um so it was at 32 finally i was like screw this i I can't hang out with this friend these friends anymore Mm -hmm. my friends love to drink they love to do drugs they love to you know we'd go camping in mexico with our surfboards we go party at the bars then we smoke crystal meth at the campground stay up all night go surf big waves like we were lunatics Mm -hmm. and it was so hard for me to ditch those friends because i i was really shy really um sensitive such an empath and i didn't want to go make new friends i was already so picky as it was and so i just kept hanging out with those same friends and it it it, it almost killed me a lot of times so that's what i did i had to ditch all those friends so i'm curious uh how that looked in your situation um i didn't ditch all of them but what i did was just made what it really helped me to get out of the bar business I have to say, I did get out of the bar business for a couple of years. And then I, yeah, <laughs> that and then it, so. it did, but I ended up actually going back when I was um, sober and actually bartended 
part time so I could grow so revives in my coaching business. So um so I have a different perspective of it, right? But those first couple years, I'm glad to have gotten out of that such that atmosphere. Um but I have had many friends who can get who have gotten sober in the in the restaurant industry. There's a lot of sober people who work in that industry, but um so I didn't really ditch I didn't I didn't say goodbye to any of my friends, I will say, or stop hanging out with them. I just hung out with them less. It's almost like I I just had to go inward, you know, and I remember telling a girlfriend 30 days in that I had quit drinking and she's like, "Oh, is that why you haven't been, you know, wanting to hang out?" I'm like, y- "Yes." <laughs> exactly right you know and then just within the process of quitting drinking alcohol the party friends really just fizzled out yeah. there was no like i had to tell like you know i can't hang out with you anymore it's time presented itself and people what people were into and the people i attracted in my drinking days cuz we do we like attract like and and you will find yourself um you know at the time of your life hanging out with people who are exactly like you. So, so I and then I have some really good friends who stuck by me through it all and like when we would go out to eat, they would ask like, "Do you care if I have a glass of wine?" I'm like, "No, not at all." And if you have friends who ask you if it's okay to drink in front of you, do not get mad. Hug them. Hug them and squeeze them tight and being like, "God, thank you so much for being considerate." and asking if this bound if if this is a boundary now between us. That's awesome. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because I mean a lot of people don't even talk about that type of stuff. So mm-hmm. you, it sounds like you have probably have have had uh, better friends than I used to pick back in the day cuz uh, half of my friends no no no, a third of my friends when, when they knew I was on a not drinking a sobriety mm-hmm. or abstinence kind of thing going on. So they would know I'm not drinking. I'll go to the bars with you or I'll go to this barbecue with you or I'll go to this house party or block party, but I'm not going to drink. Mm-hmm. And so a third of my friends on estimation would be just ambiguous about it. They they wouldn't even really remember. Maybe they'd offer me a beer. Oh, wait, I forgot. <laughs> they didn't really care. Another third was like gung ho. Okay, don't drink. Let's protect Matt so he doesn't drink. No one offered to him. Then there's another third that would try to get me to drink. Come on, you can control it. Mm-hmm. Oh, it's just it's bad situations I put myself in. Mm-hmm. Um man. She's getting all crazy. I guess I forgot she was there. And she's and, chilling. And you're an animal lover like me. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And and so now you haven't lost any rest. No, and, and Fiona is still with me to this day. So oh. yeah, so she's still she's still with us and um and yeah, I mean, animals are the greatest. They're really they are they are they are the ones who show you what unconditional love is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I was never a bird person. I always loved dogs and cats and mm-hmm. um, sea creatures, dolphins and whales and stuff. Mm-hmm. But when I was living in Hawaii about six and a half, seven years ago, <laughs> I had this intuition. All of a sudden, go to the pet store and look at birds. And I had never ever once in my life ever even considered that but it was Mm -hmm. a strong intuition Mm -hmm. where'd that come from i walk right into the pet store to the bird section and so papaya i didn't know anything about this any types of birds except for eagles and pigeons so and she's a green cheek conyo i knew nothing about them and i walk up to her and she walks up to the front of her habitat clear plexiglass stuff she cocks her head kind of at a 45 degree angle and I kid you not, this is no embellishment. It was total love at first sight. Mm-hmm. Like I fell in love with her. It was like mm-hmm. completely love at first. Come to find out, I did some research on it. And there's a thing called bird love, just like dog oh. love, cat love. I mean, right. um, and they're flock creatures too. So she likes to be with me at all times. Mm-hmm. And I interviewed uh, a therapist a while mm-hmm. back who is a mind body therapist. And I worked mm-hmm. with him for a few months to help with chronic pain back in the day. And he was telling me that they've done a bunch of studies uh, with pets and with people being in close proximity to animals. Mm -hmm. And the feeling you have when you're hanging out with animals like that and the loving state, it's like uh, you're emitting the same brain waves and neurotransmitters 
as people doing like a loving kindness meditation that that Buddhists do or something like that. Isn't that cool? Mm -hmm. Just like this animals and hugs who cares about alcohol and drugs <laughs> that's right that's right absolutely <laughs> and then when did you get when did you have the idea to start your own podcast and your your own uh, coaching practice and all that was that something that you kind of had fleshed out early on in recovery or was that something that came uh later on uh, so I got into health and fitness coaching year three um, and, uh, you know, through that process of being in that for a couple of years, I would always have people reach reach out to me about sobriety because I, I was open about my sobriety and shared it on socials um, wow. 30 days in. You know, that was just something I'm like, I'm just, this is holding me accountable. And again, I have to live the complete opposite life I was living in my active addiction. So for me, being out loud about it was very healing and um, therapeutic and accountable. So so people had known. So I was in, in the health and fitness coaching world. And then uh, there was a summer because I, I did a very early on, like the first, you know, couple weeks and I just did not groove with it at the time. It was I had too much anxiety and it was uh, talks of God. It was it was too much for me. So I went back a couple years later and I was, uh, sat at a woman's table. I was listening and I'm like, you know, there's just got to be something more empowering to this. Right. So that's how the idea of Sober Vibes started. Um, and then I got into coaching year six because it was very important for me to handle my shit, work through my shit have a very solid ground of of my own sobriety um you know work on codependency too and when i felt like the pieces were all kind of fitting together right then i was like all right i i'm stable and i can move on into this avenue in a healthy way um and so that is what happened. So in 2000, I really went on about it. I had a podcast before I started my Sober Vibes podcast. And when that ended with, with my business partner at that time, then I started the Sober Vibes podcast of February of 2020. And at the end of 2019, that's really when I got into really with Sober Vibes of of full-on coaching with just me so and then what has grown is national sober day um and just the podcast and and coaching and then my book that just came out too oh yeah mm -hmm. awesome well, so this would be a great spot uh for people to find out where they can learn more about you listen to your podcast and all that also uh what's some of the you know what's the question i'm looking for here Who's kind of like your target ideal per person that you usually work with? Like what name, like your ideal person? Cause there's a bunch of people on here. I'm sure listening to you. And then like, this is the person that I'm supposed to work with. That happens every time when we have someone that's a recovery coach or therapist, mm -hmm. or even mm -hmm. addiction medicine physician, mm -hmm. uh, the audience, almost always, there's at least a few people uh, mm -hmm. that'll be like, this is the person that I've been waiting for. <laughs> yes. They're the one. Yeah. They can just tell, right? They get this intuition, this kind of gut feeling like, oh, Courtney, she's going to, she's perfect for me. Oh, I've been waiting. This is. Yes. So I always, I work with women above the age of 35, usually high achieving women and who it's almost like a yo-yo cycle right of uh of with alcohol and who are at the point like i was at like good and tired have tried many things it doesn't resonate with them and then they're looking for more of that one-on-one -on -one coaching to really help them with accountability and support and get them out of their own bullshit because that is that is what uh that's what i was <laughs> So a lot of my one-on-one -on -one coaching too is tailored uh, to the person, but also something that I needed at that time. Because even though my boyfriend, who's now my husband, he had quit drinking with me at that time. Cool. 
he didn't have a problem though. So like, there's a very big difference when you, when somebody quits, when they don't have an, an issue. Cause then they're looking at you like, why do you have anxiety on a Friday night? Like, why do you look like you're going to crawl out of your skin? Cause it's like, well, yes, you don't understand that emotional dependence on booze and how that was a part of my life for so long. So that is who um, I usually end up working with, with my one-on-one. But yeah, so people can find me at CourtneyRecovered.com. You can listen to the Sober Vibes podcast. And my book just came out, uh, Sober Vibes, A Guide to Thriving in Your First Three Months Without Alcohol. So that, again, gets you with those 90 days. There's journal prompts in there. And it's all from a coach's perspective of really helping you through that process, but you tailoring it to yourself. Because as we talked about earlier, this is not a one size fits all. So what worked for your brother or your uncle or your sister or your neighbor is not going to work for you. So some people go to AA. Some people need a therapist. Some people need both, right? And I think that that's what people don't understand about the road of recovery and sobriety. And I've dabbled in all of them except for rehab. But like, because you have to continue to keep growing and growing with your sobriety. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that was really profound. Um, Mm -hmm. what you just said right there. And, and I haven't been in the mindset, uh, that I was in, in my addiction and, and early on in early recovery too. And so long, but it was this feeling of, okay, all I need to do is detox and then just get through the withdrawals. And Mm -hmm. then I won't ever want to use again. Once I get feeling normal again, this time, because mm-hmm. all the pain that it has caused but i never really it wasn't until this last time this no, last attempt at it that i got into personal development and i had never even heard of the word the term personal development before mm-hmm. um and it was just so serendipitous how this happened but so then i started to realize and learn wow my whole life i had a fixed mindset i thought yeah. that my mindset was fixed and this reading these books was giving me a growth mindset. And so there was no way I was going to, you know, outgrow addiction with a fixed mindset. I was going to keep. So, yeah, what you just said right there just hit me like a ton of bricks because that's what so many people, especially the family members or people mm-hmm. that are kind of new into their mm-hmm. unabil- uh, inability to control, regulate their drinking is they think it's probably going to be quicker and easier to, you know, just take care of this drinking problem or or like a family member of somebody that has a drinking problem oh they're just going to go to rehab and they're going to get fixed at rehab they're going to come back in 30 days and they're not ever going to want to drink again and what you're saying is it is so customized and it's kind of like a lifelong thing to where yeah it's it's a raising of consciousness it's a growth which is why aa works one of the reasons it works for the people that it does work for there's the social uh, aspect but it those steps help people to raise their consciousness from shame and fear and anger uh, and pride into courage and acceptance and willingness and love and all that stuff. So, okay. And then do you do group coaching too? I'm curious, or do you just one-on-one coaching? Um, and then do you I, have a yeah, I, I, I do do one-on-one coaching and I have a, I, I have a community too, a group community cool. as well. So, so I do build both. So there, I mean, there's options for people when they come into, uh, you know, into to my container, and especially too, just with free stuff. Of yeah. there's, I have 147 podcast episodes, so it's just like, start there, you know, start there. And I have a, a 30 day uh, sober not boring guide, and it's a calendar where there's something to do each day that doesn't involve drinking. And why I put this together is because earlier on I said like, dude, I I had a Google Hobbies. <laughs> like, so I created this so it takes the thought process out of it for you. Like, you know, one day it's go on a walk. Another day it's binge watch some shows. Like, you know, and challenge yourself to do this. And cause that's where it's like, when you, when you quit drinking, you're like, what am I going to do? <laughs> what am I going to do? Right? Like I'm never going to have fun again. And I just handed you 30 days of fun because it goes back to what you were saying with mindset. Fun is a mindset. 
And when your drinking gets to a point where it's not fun anymore, it's never going to go back to being fun. And so that's where you have to look at it. It's like in sobriety, you get you get to live this like two, you know, two lives in one. And you get to start creating things that you want to do and you like like and, and what is fun for you. I mean, till this day, every Saturday morning, I wake up hungover. That's fun for me. Truly, <laughs> like, because I am not going to be laying here on a couch and dry heaving on the floor. I'm not kidding you when that happened to me many, many times, you know? Yeah, and that's and that's what I was saying earlier. I can I can tell that your wisdom is pretty high. <laughs> you have high wisdom because with wisdom comes like, wow, I don't want to do that stuff anymore. Poisoning my body to to like lower my inhibitions and increase my dopamine there's just other ways to feel good and have fun and be adventurous there's other ways to do that and with wisdom and with higher consciousness but i love that idea too and that thing resource you have where it gives people different ideas for these different days the other day i was thinking of something uh, of a a one page for example the one page alcohol free lifestyle plan or something mm-hmm. where it's one page and then in that one little page crammed in like small print big enough to read there's just tons of different things to do like you said go for a walk take a bubble candle bath with music go to a concert binge watch mm-hmm. a fun show and just so then all they have to do maybe it could even be a three by five laminated card where they keep it in their wallet or their pocket or their purse. And so whenever they get, I'm bored, I'm bored, or then they just pull it out. Wow, look at all these ideas. Yeah, and, or, and or even, just, right, or just get curious about what's in your backyard of like, what what have you not done in your hometown that you don't even know that exists? Like when I got sober and the stuff I ended up finding to do, I'm like, oh my God. <laughs> this has been here the entire time and I've lived here majority of my life and it's I've never been to this like so because I was too busy at the same bar getting hammered you know or being hung over for for three four days so there's so much more to life and there's so many fun things to do like I said the the fun it's a mindset that you just have to to work with so I wholeheartedly agree. Mm-hmm. We can train our we can train ourselves to be happy and mm-hmm. just excited about the day. All right. Uh, no need any substances for that. All right. Well, I have to get ready for another appointment coming up. This has been amazing. I'd actually love uh, to interview you again sure. uh, down the road. This has been super fun. And so again, could you name your website one more time? And then of course we'll I'll put links in the show notes Thank of you. this. Yep. So it's uh, CourtneyRecovered.com. And then I did not say this, but I party most on Instagram at Sober Vibes. So just feel free to uh, reach me there. Um, anyone who wants to follow Sober Vibes or if you are looking for coaching, you feel free to DM me. Perfect. All right. Well, thank you so much. Have a great rest of your evening. This has been a pleasure. Thank you, Matt. Uh-huh. Take care.